with these videos, we're aiming to create an online library where if you don't manage to come to Full Circle uh, or any of our events that we think are worth putting up, you can come uh, in your own time and look at this video and learn about the topic. Hello, everyone. Thanks for the invitation to join you here today on this uh, auspicious day. Um, congratulations to DR Wakefield for uh, your 50th anniversary. That's, that's quite a, a landmark. Um, what I'd like to do today is sort of talk about the infrastructure of fair trade, uh, who we are, what we do, how we do it, and how we're evolving and changing to meet the uh, evolving uh, challenges that small holder producers are facing in various parts of, uh, around the world. Um, so what I'd like to do is share my screen here. Okay, can everyone see me uh, or see the slideshow? Um, so as it says here, the future of fair trade. Um, who fair, what fair trade is and what we do, if I can get this to change to the next slide. Sorry, everyone. Okay. So what is fair trade? I think it's fair to say, say that most consumers are familiar with fair trade through the products that we certify, such as bananas, tea, cocoa, flowers, coffee, and many others. But the fair trade movement at its core is basically about people and not products. We're the only certification that guarantees a minimum price and uh, the only certification that is 50% wholly owned and governed by the producers themselves. Um, I guess the good way to think about it is that we operate as a community of shared values that are based upon a set of standards and practices that we have collabor collaboratively agreed upon and are regularly audited by our independent third-party certifying agency, FlowCert. Um, Another notable difference is that fair trade only works with cooperatives that are democratically run and have demonstrated that all members have a voice in decision making. We don't work with large farms or plantations. We really believe that uh, cooperatives and small producer organizations are the, the entity's best place to meet members' needs. So um, that's why we work with with cooperatives. We also provide a series of programs and projects that help to increase the capacity of producer groups um, to meet the challenges, uh, which are many of being a smallholder farmer in the 21st century. And while coffee farming, uh, I think we all realize has never been easy, producers today are facing a set of unique and unprecedented challenges that are really causing the current as well as the next generation of farmers to question whether coffee farming is even a viable means of achieving a decent standard of living for themselves and their families. So fair trade is um, uh, an integrated network of producers who are linked to regional cooperatives, who in turn are linked to one of our producer networks in either Latin America, Africa, or the Asian Pacific regions. And the figures here, I think, speak for themselves, so I won't go into any further detail, um, other than mentioning that nearly half of the farmers within the fair trade system are coffee farmers. Uh, we currently source coffee from uh, 635 cooperatives in 34 different countries. And the fair trade premium, as you can see in the lower right-hand corner there, generates more than 85 million pounds per year directly back into those producer organizations. So fair trade is much more than, um, than just the fair trade minimum price. Although I think it's fair to say that when most people think of fair trade, they do think of the fair trade minimum price. But the reach of fair trade extends much further than that. Um, in addition to the fair trade minimum price, uh, buyers also contribute another 20 cents per pound in the form of what we call the fair trade premium. And this provides these farmer led cooperatives with the necessary additional resources to build 
um, infrastructure, undertake farm renovations, provide agricultural training, or uh, eventually to increase their capacity to weather the next storm and be that natural or an economic storm. We also run a number of continuing education programs, um, including the Fair Trade Climate Academy that's designed to help producers um, adapt to the accelerating effects of climate change that we are all seeing in the world around us and regular workshops on everything from price risk management strategy to uh, quality improvement techniques. Um, uh, after, so after, in the second section here, Fairtrade secures co-investment in farmers' futures. Um, after we established the Fairtrade minimum price many years ago, which was designed to be a safety net for farmers to help them meet the cost of production, we realized that this fair trade minimum price really wasn't enough to um, uh, provide them with the necessary scaffolding to ensure that they had the capacity to meet those challenges that, that they were encountering and still to come. So then we established the fair trade premium, which provides the resources needed to build really truly healthy, resilient small producer organizations, or as we call them SPOs. And uh, each SPO collectively decides how to invest the premium and according, that's according to their own needs and their own priorities. And this is again, democratically voted on. And I think uh, finally, fair trade acts as an advocate for trade justice and uh, reform, both in the commercial and the public arenas. And we advocate on a continuous basis for policies in both the public and private, private procurement that can ensure the most vulnerable links in the supply chains are part of the equitable value distribution within that supply chain. So uh, how, does, how, does, how do we work with farmers as they as they continue to face uh, multiple crises. And here we're just listing three crises. I, I could list probably another three, even nine, even 12. Um, as we know, both price volatility and climate have been continuing challenges for the last several years. And this past year, all of that was compounded by the additional challenges presented by COVID-19, which as we all know, has affected the entire coffee industry and the entire planet. Um, we still don't know to what extent, uh, long-term extent that the impacts of COVID are going to have on producer communities. So when we look at price, um, as we all know, the, the, the price of coffee changes every three to five minutes and sometimes uh, more frequently th than that. We've been having this long-term price crisis over the last few years, which we've seen an uptick um, recently, but you know, the, the long-term trend is probably not going to increase the price uh, substantially. And what this does is that it puts uh, farmers in this continual kind of cycle of poverty. And it, it prevents them from leading to, from investing, uh, in their farm renovations. Um, they can't hire the necessary help. And this results in lower quality and um, as an offshoot, increased child labor. Um, the fair trade minimum price, as I said before, was designed as a safety net. Um, and again, that fair trade uh, premium, which is another 20 cents, um, uh, is provided to the cooperative so that they can make those, those necessary investments. Now, COVID-19, you guys are all coffee professionals. You know the, the impacts that it's had in your uh, individual businesses. At the producer level, um, you know, a lot of internal travel was restricted. So uh, either farmers couldn't get to their fields or they couldn't hire the necessary temporary labor to help with harvest. Uh, this, you know, fortunately led to some community action in some countries like Colombia, where the where the local community came together and uh, actually helped coffee farmers harvest. Um, but it's also led to uh, a shortage of, of um, shipping containers. 
So even if coffee was harvested, many times it would sit on docks and not have a way to make it onto a ship and, and to a consuming country. It also presented, COVID-19 also presented increased uh, health and safety risks to producers. Um, and it because they couldn't get to doctors, there isn't the kind of infrastructure there in terms of health clinics um, and facilities to help to deal with not only the impacts of COVID, but just routine uh, uh, health concerns. And it also um, greatly increased the, uh, the impact of food insecurity. Additionally, schools were closed. And so, as I said, uh, farmers would oftentimes uh, engage their children in labor uh, because the temporary labor wasn't available. And so all of this uh, resulted in a fair trade producer relief and resilience fund, which we put together uh, with a, a group of partners. And we quickly distributed over 15 million euros to producer groups, again, to have them decide how to distribute it uh, to meet their local needs. Many times this was put into the form of food packets, uh, additional payments to farmers, um, uh, or, or to help with logistical needs. And I think that this is really one of the real true powers of fair trade is its connected integrated network that allows us to um, quickly move either knowledge, resources or supplies through uh, to some of the most rem remote uh, producing regions. Climate, um, I don't need to really go into too much here. I, you know, I think that probably one of the um, most alarming statistics that came out recently from both World Coffee Research and Kew Gardens was that um, it's projected that by 2050, 50% of the uh, current land that is under cultivation for coffee will no longer be suitable for coffee cultivation. What does that mean? Um, it means uh, either lower quality of coffee, increased um, uh, reliance on robusta coffees, and, uh, and of course for, um, for producers themselves, it, it, pre it presents additional um, logistical challenges and it means that they have to uh, increase their crop diversification um, and it really presents these threats to the security and livelihoods of not only producers but producer communities that are really reliant on coffee production. And so again, what we're doing is um, providing disaster relief to recent hurricanes like in Honduras and in Nicaragua. Um, we have targeted programs and climate academies that help farmers to meet the, you know, the, the numerous challenges that, that climate change is presenting. And we are continuing to do advocacy at the national and international level um, around uh, um, providing producer groups with uh, really a firm footing to be able to meet these challenges that, that climate change are presenting. So later this year, uh, Fair Trade is going to be publishing our new uh, global strategy, and it's um, the result of an 18-month process that included multiple consultations with all the stakeholder groups within the Fair Trade system, as well as uh, numerous commercial partners and many uh, government agencies. Um, the main pillars of this strategy are what you can see illustrated here. And following this, each product category and thematic area um, developed their own five-year strategy that is in alignment with what was identified as the most important um, uh, elements of the global strategy, which again is aligned with our theory of change and with the uh, uh, sustainable development goals. The coffee strategy uh, was developed over the last 10 months uh, through a series of, again, consultations with, and maybe some of you were part of our consultations with the commercial sector. Um, we interviewed uh, roasters, retailers, and traders in the EU, Asia Pacific, and North America to really take the pulse of what they're thinking about sustainability in this changing landscape, what their strategy is and how fair trade can be uh, supportive of, of those goals. And we also did internal um, consultations and focus groups 
with producers themselves and with our um, several fair trade, um, our national fair trade organizations, such as the Fair Trade Foundation in the UK, to really take the pulse of what, what's most important, what are the priorities, and, and how can we help you meet those goals? Um, I'm happy to say that the coffee strategy after a grueling period of 10 months was just approved yesterday by our fair trade executive team. So now we will start with um, some of the implementation of that strategy. And within the coffee strategy itself, we have developed several new approaches toward producer empowerment, especially under the growth and innovation section. Um, we've developed a new program that we're calling South to South, which is really trying to promote the, the use of fair trade products in producing countries themselves rather than just uh, exporting them to consuming countries. And we're starting something new later this year called the Fair Trade Coffee School. Um, for many years, we would do individual workshops, uh, regional workshops that would focus on price risk management, um, quality improvement, best agricultural practices, things like that. And they were limited in scope. And I think um, we, they didn't have the reach that we were really looking for. And so we are partnering with, a, with an online platform to develop a series of classes that will be available to um, all of the small producer organizations simultaneously. It's an interactive set of uh, classes. So participants can ask questions. They can be tested on um, uh, how well they're uh, understanding the, the, the information being provided. And it also acts as a way for us to continually improve the information um, that we're providing. Another um, uh, innovative project that we're working on that will be started in 2022 is something that we're called Next Gen. As everybody knows, um, the next generation of potential coffee farmers, the children of current coffee farmers, they've, they've had a much wider window on the world than their parents or grandparents did due to increased access to technology, the internet, uh, DVDs, uh, a variety of different media platforms, and also increased access to education. And for many of them, they see coffee farming as more or less the lowest rung on the ladder of economic opportunity. And uh, we're starting to see more and more of a youth of a youth migration into urban centers. So that you know, the the idea is is that I would rather sell phone cards than than become a coffee farmer. And so what we're trying to do is, is increase the capacity uh, and the knowledge base of youth in communities through a public-private um, scholarship program that will uh, involve working directly with the governments of producing uh, countries to provide scholarships to either universities or technical schools for youth who have youth, uh, members of the youth population who have demonstrated a certain aptitude, whether it's in community organizing, agricultural practices, uh, financial literacy, uh, any number of different skill sets that they would be provided with uh, a scholarship to either a technical school or a university to pursue a course of, of study following which um, they would return to the cooperative setting for a prescribed period of time and agreed upon a period of time uh, to really put the skill sets that they have recently acquired into real world practice and thereby also increasing the knowledge base and the capacity of the uh, small producer organizations themselves. Following that agreed upon period, then they're either free to go pursue uh, another career path or to stay within the cooperative. And this would be a continuing program. It's sort of based around the idea of the US Peace Corps. Um, we, we are also going to be reaching out to commercial partners because we've had a lot of people uh, and companies saying that they would like to increase their impact within the fair trade supply chain. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be purchasing more certified coffee, but they would like to have more internet interaction and connection with these producer communities. So we realize that beyond the scholarship, students will also be required to uh, have some sort of living expenses. And so we would ask for sponsorship from, um, from these commercial partners. 
Um, in terms of advocacy and engagement, um, uh, many of you know that we've been working for several years on a uh, living income model, um, really trying to identify uh, what the what the baselines are to achieve a living income in various regions around the world. The dollar forty fair trade minimum price was set as an average price of um, the the cost of sustainable production uh, across all of our producer networks, and that was set several years ago. And we realized that this has to be revised, and we're going through a cost of sustainable production. Uh, study uh, in collaboration with the people uh, in our own organization that are running the living income work. Um, and the living income work is, is really uh, taking different elements uh, of a producer's life, um, whether it's, uh, I guess it, it's gonna be difficult for me to encapsulize here, but um, basically it's a model that, uh, takes into consideration uh, a farmer's um, uh, size of his land, his or her land, what the ideal um, or what the maximum yield could be if all elements were in, were were magically in place, um, what uh, kind of support they would be would be required from um, their producer organizations, what kind of off farm outcome they're they're earning and what it takes to really provide a decent standard of living that includes uh, decent housing, uh, access to food year round, uh, medical care and education, and a little bit extra in case of emergencies. And this is gonna be different re in each region. And so we're benchmarking this in 10 different countries um, this year and into next year, and then being able to um, uh, develop what we call uh, fair trade living income reference prices. Um, we're, we're pretty far along in Colombia right now, Indonesia and uh, the work in Uganda is continuing and we'll continue to roll out those, those prices um, and, and this work uh, over the next few years. Um, obviously, once we set these, these living income reference prices, it's really up to uh, uh, both the industry and uh, governments to embrace them and to really be able to actualize them and put them into practice. Um, finally, over in digitization, I think everybody realizes that transparency and traceability are sort of the the main tenets of sustainability these days and fair trade is developing a series of new platforms for deliver for delivering these timely impact reports and data regarding supply chain dynamics and trends but because we are really focused on uh, producer empowerment we we don't want this to be another form of extraction from producing countries we we firmly believe that all data um, is owned by the producers themselves and we want to make sure that they can both access the information, take ownership of it, and benefit from it. So uh, it's been a little bit of a slower process than a, than, uh, a usual top-down approach, um, but we expect to have these platforms, these interactive platforms in place um, later this year and the beginning of next year. So I think um, finally, when, when we're considering sustainability strategies, I think for all of us, one of the major considerations is cost. But as an industry, we really need to consider what the price will be if we don't invest in, in sustainability of our entire supply chain. And I think one of the things that's been um, challenging uh, for me personally is in the, Back in the 1980s and 1990s, when we started talking about farmer sustainability and sustainable supply chains, we were really looking at uh, producers themselves identifying what their biggest challenges were and what could help them achieve uh, sustainable livelihoods and also increase the quality of their coffee, which would result in higher prices. And we did everything to support those efforts. And now I think we're starting to see more of a shift where 
the burden of sustainability and creating sustainable supply chains is, is, is really placed on the, on the shoulders of producers themselves. And combined with low prices um, and the, you know, uh, all of the challenges which we've just identified through uh, climate change and price volatility and um, COVID-19, um, they're in a position, they're, they're probably the, 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 the link in the supply chain that is least equipped and has the least resources to really um, take on uh, a lot of extra work in terms of meeting sustainability goals that are set by companies. And so I think that when we're looking at sustainable supply chains, we have to look at the entire supply chain. Um, what it takes to uh, transport coffee, what our packaging costs are, uh, what our roasting costs are um, in terms of carbon footprint, and really take that into an assessment and make farmers uh, be part of that system toward addressing these um, challenges rather than just the sole uh, uh, parties responsible for it. So I think that in the last 30 years or so, and certainly um, um, in the last 20 years, we've come to realize that sustainability is no longer just an ethical concern, but it presents some really existential questions regarding our current business models and the future of coffee going forward. And I think that we have the opportunity now, we're at an inflection point to really make some, some decisions that can help to influence uh, the direction of coffee in a in a in a positive direction um, in the near future and into the next generation. Thanks. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for your presentation, Peter. Absolutely fascinating. Um, one of the things that really stuck out to me was the the work that the Fair Trade um, Foundation has done surrounding living income benchmarks. Um, yeah. So I will be asking you a few questions about that. But first, we have a question from the audience from Azuz over at Coffee Link. And um, his question is, firstly, he'd like to say that it is truly transformational what the Fair Trade Foundation has done for small producers and improving cup quality. But um, one of the challenges um, that he mentioned is, why is it so difficult for small to medium-sized businesses to join the certification process? Because often that is a... Um, a challenge uh, when we speak to some of our partners that we work with that fair trade can be slightly more geared towards larger companies and it can be a bit hard as a small company to kind of harness the power of fair trade and and then sell that story to the customer yeah i think that that's a fair point and i think that one of the things that is being addressed through the new uh, global strategy is this very issue um, you know, how do we streamline the process? How do we make it easier? How do we make it less burdensome and really focus, um, you know, our resources and attention where they need to be, which is on the producers. Um, we recently launched a new program called um, the Small Roaster Scheme, which allows smaller roasters to become involved with fair trade without the initial um, uh, licensing fee. They just pay for, um, they, we work with uh, regional traders to uh, develop a system where um, smaller roasters can purchase coffees from these uh, uh, strategic partner traders. And then we will provide the roasters with uh, marketing point of sale information and materials to really advocate for fair trade in you know their both their retail and in their wholesale so i think that the fair trade foundation will be able to um, provide more information about that that sounds brilliant um yeah so back back to the um uh, the living income benchmarks i, I find it fascinating because i only really come across it in the last few, few weeks properly and obviously as you said there's so much more to fair trade than the minimum price but often that is a part of fair trade which sort of steals the headlines, so to speak. And I've been reading quite a few um, sort of documents and papers that written by, by you guys um, in your research into the, the living income benchmark along with the Global Living Wage Foundation. And it was, was what I found really interesting, um, I don't know why it's, it surprised me so much, but there's the difference in uh, living income varies so much within countries. 
So therefore, at the, you know, at the moment, we have a fair trade minimum price for forever coffee globally, when really it sounds like we should be, which is what's happening, but at least have a, a national um, minimum price per country. And I guess in the long term, you could even argue that that needs to be sort of broken down into a regional minimum price for um, producers across different countries that have such varying degrees of living income. Um, is that something which you guys are sort of looking into? Or what? You did mention that when you have finished the study, it would be up to the market to kind of try and take that information and use it as best possible. Um, have you, what, kind, what, kind of, um, what kind of discussions are you guys having? It sounds pretty interesting. Yeah, so we're having, you know, there, there has been continual discussions about should there be regional fair trade minimum prices and how does that relate to um, uh, the living income work? Um, and I think that those discussions will be taken up again um, at the end of this year as we, as we launch into the cost of sustainable production. Uh, study. Uh, the last one that we did was several years ago, and it really wasn't as comprehensive in scope as, as I think is necessary now. So um, even though 84% of fair trade certified coffees come from Latin America, we really want to include those producer groups from Asia and, and Africa to make sure that we're having a balanced approach to this. Um, the problem is, how do we how do we manage all of these different prices and how do we ensure that um, they're being paid and distributed uh, in an equitable way that um, because fair trade we're we're primarily um, a certifying agency and we don't have a large footprint when it comes to being able to um, to manage the more business aspects of of making sure that fair trade minimum price would be paid in all of these different regions and all of these different prices. So I think that that's the challenge that we're facing. Absolutely. It's, it's interesting because it, I think I think fair trade is definitely uh, leading leading the world in, in that sense in terms of like set, like investigating living income benchmarks and seeing how that relates to coffee. Um, so yeah, look, very much looking forward to hearing how that develops. Um, gonna turn to the audience now from uh, Dio Whitefield's Tom Hay, who is behind the scenes uh, running this event. So uh, he's gonna pop on in a minute, but um, he's asked the South to South model is very interesting. What is the awareness and demand for fair trade products like in producing countries compared to that of the global North? Yeah, so I, you know, again, it depends on regionally. I think the first model that we're exploring is in Brazil um, and it's around orange juice. Um, and eventually coffee. I think, um, you know, it's, uh, Brazil has, has uh, a fairly robust coffee consuming uh, population. And so it made sense for us to, to try to develop it there. I think it's in the initial stages right now, but we hope that in 2022, it's gonna become sort of a pilot model that we can then uh, sort of learn from and migrate into, into different regions. Uh, obviously, a place like Costa Rica, Costa Rica would be next, um, but we're also looking at, you know, certain certain places in Africa where this might be applicable. Thank you. Um, I've got another question as well from Constantin, asking if there's an underlying economic theory underlying fair trade. Yeah, I mean, I think it 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 it. <laughs> It, it sort of flies in the face of, of traditional capitalism, which is, you know, buy, buy low and sell high. And when we're looking at, the, I think there was a report in 2018, 2019 by a, by a major coffee uh, importer that said that 61% of coffee farmers sold their, their harvest at below the cost of production. And when we look at that number and, and then extrapolate it to you know, a continuing price crisis, it, we're talking about sustainability, not only in terms of um, the environment, which is the way that it used to be really applied and looked at, but also how, how is this economically sustainable? And it used to be that, um, well, if, if there were challenges in Honduras, we would move on to El Salvador and, and, and replace the coffees that we were buying from Honduras with El Salvador. But now we're starting to see that 
the compounding of all of these problems having to do with youth migration, um, uh, climate change, and price volatility, and this and this continuing spiral of poverty are are system wide, and so we 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 can't easily transfer from one to the other anymore. And so I think that what we're that what fair trade is based upon is that if if any supply chain, if any food supply chain is going to become truly sustainable, it has to start with um, uh, the very first link and ensuring that those people wake up every day and say yes, because once they start saying no, you know, the, the whole coffee industry or whatever industry we're talking about is sort of built on sand. So. It, our, our economic theory is starting at the beginning of that chain and making sure that there's some kind of value distribution to ensure th that that first link is viable. Yeah, the, um, the same uh, attendee, Constantin, has asked if you can comment that if you, there is a minimum price, it is substantially above production costs. Um, you know, are there problems surrounding oversupply with sort of the incentive to just produce more oversupply of certified coffees i think so yeah yeah so currently um uh i think the current figure is about 35 percent. so 35 percent of all uh certified coffees fair trade certified coffees are sold on certified terms so oversupply is a problem um but one of the things that we recently discovered in the consultation is that, you know, not all producer groups want to sell 100% of their coffee on fair trade terms. Many farmers are multiple certified. Some of them are producing micro lots of a lot higher quality, which would um, demand prices much higher than fair trade minimum. So I think that that the um, the fair trade certification plays into a a strategy for a lot of producer groups that is um, encompassing not only uh, crop diversification, but also diversification in terms of the, the coffees that they're selling, who they're selling it to, if, whether it's going to the internal market, whether it's going to um, uh, different certifications or whether it's going to a much higher end specialty market. Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's, it's interesting because, again, it goes back to this minimum price issue and how you touched on in your presentation that there's a lot of fair trade, but often it's the minimum price which um, garners all the attention and discussion. Um, I think um, I've got another question come in from Andrew, who is saying that also the, there are problems in the, U, in the UK with British farmers selling milk and other products below cost of production. Um, with some criticism that supposedly not all fair trade money actually goes back to the farmers. How true is this? Not not all fair trade money goes back to the farmers. Yeah, it's, I'm trying to decipher the question, but um, I think if I can just develop this question, sometimes um, in coffee, Obviously, the minimum price is is to the exporter, not to the smallholder farmer, and so I, I guess um, that sort of driven this move by fair trade to look at farm gate pricing and benchmarking um, living income. So, I, could, could you argue that although the fair trade minimum price at the moment is not a minimum price to the farmer, there is work being done to see how that export price gets translated back to the farmer. Yeah, so um, actually the, the fair trade minimum price gets paid to the cooperative, right? Not and, and in some cases, the cooperative acts as the exporter in some countries, yeah. that's illegal, right? So, um, uh, and I think, you know, the, the, the living income model is based on farm gate. Um, we're looking at the cooperative level and the FOB price. So, you know, I think that there is going to be some discussion about how do we merge these two? How do they complement one another? Um, and how do we guarantee that that living income farm gate price gets delivered to directly to the farmer when uh, so much of our model is based around 
uh, working at the cooperative level. Yeah, I think it's 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 interesting because obviously fair trade, as you as you mentioned, it, it's all about the smallholder farmer trying to protect those individuals, but obviously um, through the structure of a cooperative. So um, there's always that interesting dynamic of the individual and, and the co-op and how that fits in. Um, I, th I think in terms of sort of marketing the message of fair trade, I think certainly like myself, um, I don't mention it enough to, to some people that we work with on the roasting side because anything which is fair trade obviously, as you said, comes from a smallholder farmer. Um, and it does exclude anyone with estates above a certain number of hectares. So um, sometimes it, I think what it does is it shows the logic uh, for trying to discover fair prices is different for farms of different sizes and in different production models and systems. And, you know, just because fair trade might work in one community doesn't mean it'll work somewhere else. That's not necessarily an issue because um, there are many different ways to, to trade coffee and, and buy and sell other different products that are encapsulated within the label. So, um, but it, I have got Andrew Richardson again. But yeah, a lot, a lot of the dialogue on the on the Q&A here is about minimum pricing. And to be honest, it looks more about economic theory about what are the pros and cons of a free market versus a command economy where um, we have set pricing and minimum pricing. Um, so I think let's go and check if we've got any more questions. I would, if we're expanding on this point about um, sort of minimum wages, that will actually be discussed tomorrow in one of our talks on farm gate pricing as well. Um, we talk about even in the U like. I use the UK here as reference. There, there is a minimum wage in the country. There's also a living wage and there's also a London living wage, which kind of harks back to what we were talking about, how you have different benchmarks in different regions per, per countries. Um, I was wondering, you, you did say that the fair trade uh, minimum price was set many years ago. Uh, when, when was it set and when do you think it will be sort of discussed again? Yeah, it was set in 2011, actually. Um, and the cost of sustainable production study will start, um, I think, in August or September this year. And we're still defining what the scope of that is and how it's going to be carried out and how we can leverage the activities that we're doing already in living income. And, you know, what, what's a viable sampling size, um, you know, given the fact that there are so many regional differences. So I think that I would say by the end of 2022, certainly, and uh, hopefully before, we'll have that data. And then that will trigger a fair trade minimum price review. Um, and that's a series of consultations. Now, on the one hand, you know, given the fact that coffee prices have been so low, the producers themselves have uh, said in these consultations that they don't want the fair trade minimum price to rise because it's going to it's going to decrease the volume that they sell on fair trade minimum terms right so um, i think the industry you know we we all want to uh, ensure that coffee farmers get you know a, a much greater share of the value distribution within the within the supply chain but if we start really doing the calculations is the industry willing to pay those prices, right? Uh, so, so, so we work at a dollar forty at the cooperative level. Let's say that that dollar forty was delivered to farmers. Okay, now what are the financing costs and administrative costs of the cooperative? How does that then reflect in a higher price to the exporter? How does that then reflect? You know, it we we would be adding a lot of different costs to ensure that um, that every farmer gets paid a dollar forty and we really invest in the cooperatives thinking that they are the best in the best position to be the voice of the producer and that that's the best pathway to empowerment rather than um, individual farmers negotiating prices on their own yeah i think that's a really interesting like sort of question to have as well because we, we've seen recently um, in a country where there was an exporter basically buying all the tastiest micro lots of 
producers that were part of cooperatives. And obviously they, that one year, because they're, they got paid really great pricing, um, but because it's a smallholder farm, uh, hard to replicate year on year, this exceptional quality. Um, and, you know, when they sold their best stuff to the independent exporter, they obviously, the cooperative didn't like that. So they said like, you know, please can you leave our cooperative because you're not sort of playing by the rules of being in a cooperative. Um, you know, we, we try and have stronger together and we, we try and get a better average cup and therefore price. And then the next year when they don't produce an exceptional cup of coffee and it's solid like 81, 82, um, you know, they, they don't have a cooperative to, to help support them. So that's definitely a problem that we've come across in quite a few different countries where the speciality community is trying to get a better outcome, which is, which is a great goal to pay farmers for better quality coffee. But actually sometimes the outcome is, is not as simple as as they might have thought. Yeah, I mean, I think the better model is to identify those farmers that are that are producing exceptional micro lots and then really do the work to understand how those coffees were produced and what conditions um, uh, were, were present to produce those coffees and disseminate that throughout the cooperative so that the cooperative themselves can raise um, you know, the overall quality. And I think that rather than skimming off the top 5%, another way to approach it would be to identify the 5% in the lowest quality and take that out and continually improve the coffee that way. Because, you know, as we know, there's, there's a robust internal market in some countries that would look at, at that lower 5% as a, as a much uh, improved step over triage that's being sold in within the country. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, we've, I'm sure they won't mind me saying it, um, I think Lennon from Sonic Cafe is on this uh, call, but uh, we, we, we work with a co-op in Peru called Sonic Cafe and they provide like exceptional quality coffee and um, we tried to do a project where we sort of separated um, some of the best lots per season per producer. We found that actually it worked much better to buy a sort of more macro lot um, of a higher scoring coffee um, from the cooperative that we could then source every year and also give the farmer the incentive that every year if they produce great coffee, they've got access to that, um, that better um, producing lot, which pays better um, and therefore keeps the incentive of producing great coffee every year and also keeps in the spirit of the cooperative where everyone's treated the same. And you know, if you have great coffee, then you get paid a bit better for it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that definitely has been a few learning curves recently regarding that. Um, I think it also just shows generally uh, how in the coffee community, we all might want to, we all might have the same desired outcomes, but actually like if we take various different routes, we can actually get led astray, even though our intentions are really good. Oh. Um, I think got the uh, nod from Tom. So we are now gonna go into a breakout room and in 10 minutes, we're gonna move on to the next talk. So if you've got time, Peter, it'd be great to yeah, sure, chat sure. in the breakout room. Um, sure. I just want to say thank you very much um, for your very interesting presentation. And um, yeah, we will be chatting about decaf in 10 minutes.